Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Thank you for being here this morning. Again, my name is Eric Alexander. Um, this first slide that you're going to see this morning is a picture of one of my best friends in the entire world. This is his uh, headstone. And um, years ago when he passed away, his mom asked me, what do you think we should put on here? And I thought, oh my goodness, what a question. And uh, this song that we're going to play was really popular at the time. And I thought to myself, this guy was like a brother to me. He was like a brother to a lot of people. And in fact, he was actually a cousin to a, a few people out here. And there's nothing more fitting to a guy that made everyone feel like they were part of his family than to have the chorus of this song put on his headstone. So uh, anyway, I'm grateful to be here to be your brother. And I hope you will embrace me as I hope to embrace you as brothers and sisters. Just like the church is always referred to in the New Testament as brothers and sisters, that's what I hope we can be for each other. Praises are 
Praise God this morning. You can be seated. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. Well, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for the people on this stage and the gifts you give them. Pray that they would just continue to use them. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to surround us in this place this morning. Thank you for Brett. I pray that you would uh, just use his message to stir our hearts and to help us to empower someone to be a leader and uh, empower someone to never to be afraid to uh, praise your name and to stick up for what is right and to um, just shine a light in this dark world wherever they go. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. My name is Brady, and I help out on Wednesday nights leading worship and small groups for our student ministry. 
If you're new here today, welcome. We are so glad that you're joining us today as we seek new life through Jesus for Edmond and the world. If you would like to learn more about our church, I encourage you to visit our Welcome Center located in the large room behind you. You can also scan the QR code that's right in front of you. This code takes you to a list of opportunities for you to get plugged in with. This list changes often, so be sure to check it out each week. Our women's ministry is about to begin their fall Bible study. Registration is now open for you to select which day you would like to attend. They have class options on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturdays. Our women's circle groups are having their annual lemonade stand bake sale Sunday on September 11th. All of the proceeds go towards college scholarships to help out our graduating seniors or college students who are members of our church. The big sale will take place in between services in our great hall. Also on September 11th, Pastor Eric will begin a new sermon series on the life of Samson. There is much we can learn from Samson's story, not only about ourselves, but more importantly about God's faithfulness and love for us. We are truly excited for this series to begin. Keep a lookout for the new study guide that follows in this series next week and use it with your microgroups, classes, or at home with your family. We are so thankful for your amazing generosity. Your generosity helps bring in new life through Jesus for Edmund and the world. If you would like to give today, you can either drop off your donations at our stations in the back of the sanctuary or visit the website or app to easily give from your personal device. Thank you for your consideration to give. Community is important for us here at First Pres. We want to know each other, so will you please stand and greet your neighbor in the love of Christ. Good morning, church. I hate to interrupt. I know there's amazing community happening all over. It's so good to be with you this morning. My name is Brett Hardy. I'm the director of Emerging Generations here at First Pres. It's a privilege to be in worship with you this morning. I'm so glad that you're here. Hopefully, as summer has been winding down, uh, your family maybe is shifting into fall rhythms, whatever that might look like, and preparing for uh, the, the seasons to change and uh, just a beautiful, hopefully, hopefully we get a fall and not just snap right into winter uh, this year. That would, be, that would be great. Let's turn our attention to God's Word. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, says this. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning, and God, we give thanks that there are passages in Scripture that although we may read them and we may think to ourselves, we're unsure how this applies to our lives or how this is inviting us to be transformed, if we'll look closely, we can see an example for how we are to live and how your kingdom is to be expanded. And so, God, I pray this morning that your word would speak to us. I pray that you would challenge us. I pray that you would bring names to our mind this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was 17 years old, I, uh, I preached my very first sermon. 
Uh, the youth pastors at the church that I attended had just resigned from our church, and the leadership had asked one of the dads in the student ministry to step in and to, uh, to just sort of gather the student leaders together and to kind of assign some responsibilities out to the student leaders to try and keep things together as they, they walk through this transition. And my first task that was assigned to me as a student leader was to give one of the first sermons after, uh, after our youth pastors had, had left. And I can remember it so clearly. I worked on that sermon like night and day for 10 days straight. I poured over my text. And I used text from all different areas of the scriptures. I thought about my peers as I wrote and I prayed and I asked God to, to share with me what it is that they needed to hear. And my sermon that day was on the Lord's Prayer from Matthew chapter 6. And in fact, I still use the very same Bible that I used uh, that Sunday. And in Matthew chapter 6, I still have the notes written on the, the sides of my Bible from that sermon. Some of my family members came to that sermon uh, that day and some of those same family members came this morning as well. Um, and in fact, my, my brother came, but he couldn't, he was so nervous he couldn't come in the room. But I could see him pacing outside the windows of the room. He actually came in the room today, so let's, we'll see how that works out. But when I stood up to preach the sermon, it only lasted seven minutes. I didn't think that it was going to be that long of a sermon. I, I had prepared. I had seven pages worth of manuscript ready to go. I didn't think it was short on content, but it only lasted seven minutes. In fact, halfway through the seven minutes, I dropped one of the pieces of paper uh, that I had written my sermon on, and as I went to stick it back in my uh, sermon, I didn't remember which order it went in. And so I ended up preaching one of the pages twice. Here's what I can tell you. When I imagined how that sermon would go and the impact that it was going to have on my peers and my leaders in the room that day, I had some pretty high expectations of what was going to happen. I'm not saying that I expected everyone in the room to give their life to Christ that day or to begin confessing their sins to one another, but I expected almost everyone to, to do that. But let's just say that as I finished the sermon and as I took my seat seven minutes later in the front row, you could pretty much hear crickets in the room that day. In fact, uh, and, and, and it wasn't because I had left everyone speechless, by the way. In fact, the, the, the dad who'd been put in charge, he wasn't even back from his bathroom break yet. And so we just sort of sat there waiting until he got back in the room to explain to us what we would do with the remaining 15 or 20 minutes that we had left that morning. For those of you that have been here recently and heard me speak, you know that things have changed a little bit. In fact, I've got a tendency lately of been going too long. I'm working on that. We're going to try and not let that happen today. No promises. Um, but it would have been easy for anyone in the room that day, myself included, to have seen me give that sermon and to have thought to themselves, that was fine. It was fine. It was a little short. A little all over the map as far as keeping it focused, but it was fine. And, and no one would have ever thought twice about me or that sermon again. I was able to, to fill in the gap for leadership until they could figure out what to do the next Sunday. And for most of the people in the room, that's exactly what happened. As far as I'm aware, no one came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior that day. But there was one guy in the room that morning who I don't think even heard most of my sermon. And I don't know why this is the case, but for some reason, he saw something in me. It may have just been that I was the only one who was willing at the time to give up and give a sermon that day. But he saw something in me that could be cultivated and nourished and refined. Now, I'm not necessarily that this saying that this particular guy took me under his wing or they began to, to teach me everything that he knew. Uh, I don't even think that this guy and I really ever had any deep visionary conversations and, and him ever really saying anything about how one day, 17 years later, you're going to be on staff at a church leading teams of people and preaching sermons regularly. That wasn't what this particular guy was called to do in that season. He simply 
let me keep serving. He gave me some more opportunities. And just a few months after I gave that first sermon, as I entered the spring semester of my senior year of high school, I I enrolled in the professional internship program at my school, and I actually began interning for the church, that church, uh, my senior year of high school. That following summer, a new youth pastor was hired, and, and he actually did take me under his wing and begin mentoring me. He invited me to stay on all the way through college, to intern all the way through college. And he, he, he invited me to, to help learn how to plan Sunday morning services and, and to plan events and, and trips. And he slowly gave me more and more responsibilities and leadership opportunities. This new youth pastor, he discipled me. And he, he, he did sit me down and, and have, have deep conversations with me about what it was that God was doing in my life and and how I was good at certain things, but there were other things that were weaknesses and how I could work on those things. And over the next four years, this is exactly what I did until my senior year of college came. And, And then, actually, that church came to me and they invited me to join the staff as a full time graduate resident. But just a few months later, I was actually invited, I was hired to come and be the pastor of student ministries at another church in another state. And so I I left and I I went and did that. But the church that had just spent four and a half years cultivating me and nurturing me and refining what it was that God had put inside of me, they, before they sent me off, they gathered together and they had this great celebratory party for me. And they, they gave me cards, and they, they gave me gifts, and they gave me hugs, and, and they sent me off to my next season of life with a couple years' worth of ministry underneath my belt. Why do, I, why do I share this whole story with you this morning? What does this have to do with you, First Pres? Well, over the last year and a half, I've used my opportunities with you here on, on Sunday mornings to, to talk about the seven core practices of First Presbyterian Church of Edmond. For those of you that don't know what it is that I'm talking about, we have seven statements, uh, seven practices, seven values, if you will. You can see them on signs and, and banners throughout our church that our elders came up with many years ago. They were led by God to, to put these practices into place. And they, they really just sort of give a framework or a filter, if you will, for what we as a body of believers, for what we as a church will be about, for how we will do life together as a church. And over the past year and a half, I've, I've been able to cover six of those. And finally this morning, although there are no particular order, we're, we're getting to the last one uh, that we have not covered. And so if you cannot tell by the story that I just shared with you about my journey into ministry this morning, this last core practice that I'm going to talk about is actually by far the one that gets me really, really excited. That's why I saved it for last, because I knew that if I talked about it early on, you would be able to tell my enthusiasm waning about the others as we, as we went through them. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't get me wrong. I love all of the, the core practices here at First Press. They are this. Pray together. Read and practice Scripture. Serve community. Share who you are. Invest in others. Care for one another. And then today, as we wrap up the seven core practices, I want us to take a look at the core practice of create and send leaders. Create and send leaders. And I just want to say from the outset as we, as we jump into this this morning, first prez, this is something that we have gotten a lot better at over the last few years. We're not perfect By any stretch of the imagination, we have a lot more that we can do. And I do believe that God has some really big things on the horizon for us. But as a body of believers who are gathering together and worshiping together and and doing life together, this core practice is one that we have really been investing in. And I am so proud of of what God has been doing. See, I arrived on staff here at First Pres in October of 2017, and that first year that I came on staff here, there was no specific budget that had specifically been sort of set aside to intentionally invest in young leaders in the different departments of our church. Now, 
Just to be clear, that's not to say that leadership development hadn't been happening or that it wasn't happening. It was happening. It just wasn't something that we, as a church, had taken specific and intentional steps to build into our DNA from a financial standpoint. But over the past five years, you guys have given me the privilege of investing the resources of First Presbyterian Church of Edmond into more than 25 interns that have come through the ministries of this church. They've come through worship ministry, student ministry, communications, and pastoral ministry. And today, First Presbyterian Church of Edmond has sent leaders all over the United States and the world. Adam, Anna, Josh, Kat, Hannah, Cooper, Trace, Jake, Travis, Chase, Christian, Brennan, Ben, Faith, Paige, Chuck, Will, Abby, Kurt, Braden, Ruth Ann, the list goes on and I know on and on. And I know that for some of you, as I read those names, for, for you there's a face that flashes before your eyes. Just, just from those interns that I just listed alone, we have sent leaders to Clinton, Oklahoma, Central Alabama, Tulsa, Oklahoma, St. Louis, Missouri, Norman, Oklahoma, Nepal, Charlotte, North Carolina, Dallas, Texas, Stillwater, Oklahoma, Guatemala, Denver, Colorado, Kentucky, and all over the Oklahoma City metro area. And that is just the interns that you have been investing in over the last five years. There are so many other areas of leadership that I could talk about that we've been investing in and developing as well. From new missionaries that have been sent to new Sunday school teachers that have been developed to one-on-one -on -one mentoring that you're doing that I, I probably don't even know the names of those people. But this year, church, you budgeted over $40,000 to invest in and create and send leaders here at First Presbyterian Church of Edmond. Yeah, it's something to celebrate. But people ask me all the time, what if we just kept those leaders? What if we just sort of hang on to them? People say to me all the time, could you just imagine the young adult ministry that, that we could have here at First Pres if we hung on to all these leaders? And I'm just telling you, Jim and I go to lunch and talk about it all the time. If we just held on to some of these leaders, how, what kind of young adult ministry could we have here? Trust me, yes, I think about it. The thought has crossed my mind. I promise you, I can imagine the crowds that we could pro probably gather if only we kept the leaders that we were pouring into. In fact, if I were left to my own devices, that's probably exactly what would happen. I'd just keep them. I'd, I'd hang on to them. I tell people all the time, creating leaders is one of my favorite parts of my job. I love that that's what I get to do. Sending leaders, not so much. Not a huge fan of that part. In fact, I've thought about petitioning our session, our elders here. So if you're on session, a letter might be coming your way about changing this core practice to create and keep leaders instead of create and send. That would make my job look a lot better if we did that. But I want to draw our attention back to Scripture the, the scripture that we started with this morning. This is Paul writing here in this scripture. Paul, one of the writers of most of the New Testament, and he says this. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him that is genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself may come also. 
So just as sort of some background information about what's happening here in this scripture, Paul, the author of this book, Philippians, he's writing this letter from prison. It's estimated that he's probably writing from Rome or at least as a prisoner on his, on his way to Rome. And Paul is sending Timothy to Philippi. Now, again, we don't necessarily know this for certain about where this is all happening or, or, or the, the, the timeline of this uh, perfectly, but scholars kind of estimate that that would have been over a thousand miles between where Paul was to where he was sending Timothy. Now, Paul does say that he hopes to go there at some point in time, but the truth is that at this very moment, Paul cannot go to Philippi. Not only is he in prison or on his way to prison somewhere, so he's physically unable to go, but Paul, just by nature, he soaks up every opportunity to minister to the place that he is, and he does not move on from that place until he is led by God to do so. And so Paul not only cannot go to Philippi because he's physically unable, but Paul is also not going to Philippi because he is spiritually unable to go there. But as Paul often does for us, he models for us what it looks like to live a life that expands the kingdom of God. Not just in the words that he writes that tells us how our hearts can be transformed and our our lives can be transformed, but Paul does this in the way that he's living his life. See, Paul has been doing life with Timothy. If you're not familiar with the relationship between, between Paul and Timothy in the Scriptures, it's, it's really important to understand that, that Paul and Timothy, they serve as sort of the preeminent model, if you will, for creating and sending leaders. Timothy begins to, to travel and to, to share the gospel uh, with Paul on his journeys at a very early age in his life. Scholars estimate that he's probably as young as 16 years old when he began to travel on these journeys with Paul. And we see the first time that happens in the book of Acts, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. It says this. It says, Paul came to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium, but Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in number daily." And it's estimated that from this point on, for the next 20 years, Timothy and Paul are going on these very journeys all over the world together. Oftentimes they're going together, but at least on occasion, at least in certain points, Timothy is sent as Paul's representative, like we see here in Philippians. Or on other occasions, uh, Timothy's actually left to be in charge of a situation or, or a church as we see in the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy. We see in 1st Timothy chapter 1 that, that Paul is writing to Timothy because he's been entrusted with leading the church in Ephesus as they battle against false doctrine. And in these, these books, we see Paul call Timothy my true child in the faith, 1st Timothy 1. He says, you man of God, entrusted with righteousness and godliness and faith and love and gentleness. In 1 Timothy 6. My point is this. Paul realized early on in his ministry that if the gospel of Jesus Christ was going to be spread all over the world, if the gospel was going to be taken to the ends of the earth, if the message of Jesus was going to reach all people, if sound doctrine about the person of Jesus Christ and the life of the believer was going to be guarded and protected and preached and shared, That was not going to happen simply by Paul demanding that it happen. It wasn't going to happen simply by Paul writing letters to the churches that he had gone and established and demanding that someone stand up and and read those letters aloud before the congregation. It wasn't going to happen simply because Paul had good intentions of making it happen. It wasn't going to happen sometime in the future 
once the people of those churches that Paul had established grew up into spiritual maturity. The only way that it was going to happen was that Paul was going to have to invest and entrust what it was that God had been doing in him to someone else. He was going to have to cultivate and, and encourage and foster and call out the spiritual gifts of another person. He was going to have to pour his life into another person. And it became clear to Paul that Timothy was that person. And as a result, all throughout the New Testament, we have this example of these two men either directly or indirectly influencing huge chunks of the world. In fact, it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, that at one point in time, on, on their journeys around the world, it says the entire residents of Asia, both Jew and Greek, had heard the word of the Lord because of their work. The entire residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord because Paul was investing in this man. And this is why I just want to kind of pause for a moment because I know that it can be easy to, to hear all about the work of Paul and Timothy and the, the lives that were changed and the way the, the world was changed and the churches that were started and the miracles that happened and, and to think, wow, wow, that's incredible. One man invested in another and they, did, they dedicated their lives to, to traveling all over the globe, spreading the gospel. And to think, well, that's what they did. That's what they did. That's what they did for a living, actually. In fact, they were missionaries. This is what they were called to do, to go and to, to spread the gospel, to protect the church and her doctrines. And it's easy to just sort of think about that and then to say to ourselves, well, I'm a banker. I'm a mechanic. I'm a teacher. I'm an artist. I'm a musician. I work at a coffee shop. I'm not called to be a missionary. I don't make my living traveling around and, and spreading the message of Jesus. So this idea of creating and sending leaders, really, it's, it's not all that relevant to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, Brett. I, I love what it is you're saying, Brett. I think this is important stuff. I, I think this is awesome. I think this is very needed. And, and listen, I'll do my part to to share the gospel on occasion as I maybe encounter someone. But I love that this gets you excited. But, but is this really required of me? Can you show me in the Bible where it says that I have to create and send leaders? And the truth of the matter is, no, I can't. So if you're looking for an out this morning, I just gave it to you. The Bible doesn't say you have to do this. I cannot point you to a specific scripture that says, thou shalt invest in someone else so that someone else helps expand the kingdom of God. If a written commandment is what it is that you're looking for, on this one, you're off the hook. But then again, I can't find anywhere that says that Paul had a written commandment to invest in Timothy. As far as I can tell, there was nothing specific in, in the, the laws of Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament or, or in Jewish tradition, that, that sort of would have required that Paul do this, that Paul invest his whole life into Timothy, and that by default, Paul's you know, ministry, would uh, his impact would be doubled or tripled or, or quadrupled, and he was supposed to do this. Paul just knew that Jesus said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Which, by the way, is written in Matthew 28, 19, if you do want a scripture reference. But it seems as though Paul understood that this one, that as one singular individual person, the reality of making disciples of all nations by himself was impossible. Now, the truth of the matter is, that was then, this is now. It's, two, it's 2022. 
some of those realities have changed a little bit for us, right? I mean, we have the ability now to, to travel by plane and, and to be in multiple cities and states and even countries in a matter of a few hours. We have technology that, that allows us to link up visually and audio-wise to the other side of the world. We can literally be broadcasting uh, in real time to the other side of the world. We have YouTube and Facebook that can reach billions of people every single day. So certainly it is true today that one person can have a massive impact. And listen, I've listened to a ton of sermons and podcasts and, and audiobooks, and, and I've read lots of great blogs and, and books of people that I'm never going to meet in person. People that are, that are never going to sit down and, and disciple me. People that are never going to take me to coffee or, or lunch. I've watched countless online messages of pastors that I'm never going to have the opportunity to meet. And certainly, to a certain degree, those messages and those books and those podcasts and, and all those things, they influence me. But nothing will compare to the five years that I spent doing life arm in arm with the guy who knew me and invested in me. The guy who was able to discern my spiritual gifts and call them out. The guy who, who knew my weaknesses and helped me improve upon them. Who gave me opportunities to lead when I was not ready. No amount of books or, or podcasts or online messages can compare to one person sitting down with you one-on-one -on -one for countless coffees and lunches. Psalm 71 verse 18 says this. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to, the, to all those who come. And church, if we want to be a people who declare the might and the power and the message and the hope and the grace and the redemption to another generation, we simply can't use the excuse of, well, I'm not a minister. I'm not a missionary. I'm a doctor. I'm a businessman. I'm, you fill in the blank. No, you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we are called to take his message to the nations. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says this. It says, you then, my child... Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, this is our model for reaching the nations. What you've heard from me. What you've learned from me, what you and I have just spent our lives doing together, now you go do it with someone else. You see, Mike, the guy that invested in me for five years, he could have just said to the church that called him, that was a, in another state, the church that I ended up going to as my first call into ministry, he could have just said when, when they called him, he could have just said, you know what, listen, I'll come. I'll come. I, I know that you really need someone to come and to live in your community and to, to be amongst your students and to do life with your students and to disciple them, someone that's going to be able to walk with them every, every day of their lives. But, but listen, I've got some time in September. I'm going to swing through there for a few days. I'll spend some time there, and then I'll be back next June. I'll come. No, I can't leave the church that I'm working at right now. I'm not, I'm not done here yet, but, but I'll work you in. I'll make time. No, he didn't say that. He said, I can't come to you, but I'm sending Brett. He's proven himself worthy of the gospel, and I'll vouch for him. I've been doing life with him for the past five years, and I know where he's strong, and I know where he's weak. And if he needs anything, he'll call me. I'm sending Brett. And listen, First Prez, I, I want to say again, I am so proud of you 
as a church because we have come so far the past five years when it comes to creating and sending leaders. But what if this morning we're just getting started? What if all over the world, First Presbyterian Church of Edmond was known as a church that not only spent significant portions of their budget on creating and sending leaders, but was known as a people who did life with the next generation of leaders in such a way that we said, hey, we can't come to you. We're not done with the work in our own community, but we're sending Will. We'll vouch for him. We've been doing life with him over the past few years. We, we can vouch for him. We know his strengths, and we know where he's weak. He's going to be perfect for you, and if he needs anything, he'll call us. Talk about declaring the power of God to the next generation. And church, I stand before you today because someone, a man, a ministry, a church, invested in me. They cultivated what God was doing in me, and they sent me. And listen, I want you to know, I want to be super clear, I am more than happy to keep doing what it is that I do here at First Pres. I love my job. I I am absolutely more than willing to keep going and getting coffee and lunch and inviting uh, our young adult leaders over to my house for dinner and and to play cards and to, to hear what God's doing in their life. I have fallen in love with what it is that I do here at First Pres. But my question is this, what if you did it too? What if you went to coffee and lunch with a young leader too? What if you sat with them and listened to what God's doing in their life? Helped them wrestle that out a little bit. Just showed up as a a steady presence that helped them figure these things out. Not necessarily having all the answers, just being there. Can you imagine the, the impact that we could make collectively Several years ago, I, I remember a, a guy in this church, many of you know him, his name is Brian Horner. He stood up here on this stage and, and he shared about how every month he gets his credit card statement in the mail and how he looks at that credit card statement and he thinks to himself about all the things he's bought that month that just don't matter. They just don't matter. And he looks around and he doesn't even see any evidence of where all that money was spent. But when he looks at the money that he invested in the church, how he's financially given to the church, he doesn't feel that way. How he sees what God is doing in the church to expand the kingdom. I just remember sitting and listening to Brian and thinking, I love that. I love that thought. But what if we weren't just talking about money? What if we were talking about something so much more? What if we were talking about people that we invested in? And then they invested in someone. And then they invested in someone. And before you know it, you do look around and see the impact of the investment that you have made on an entire generation. And so, church, I just ask you this morning, what would it look like for you to continue to maybe take another step in creating and sending leaders? Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning and we give, thank you, we give thanks for your word and the challenge that it is before us. And God, I thank you for our elders that have put this framework before us about how we as a church can live. And God, I pray that today as we leave here, you would just draw names to our mind. Maybe just one name of someone that we can invest in and spend time with that will impact the next generation. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. We invite this morning to the Lord's table all that truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking forward in his holy ways. We are called to a life of faithful obedience. Now using the words of the Apostle Paul, let us all examine ourselves. Paul writes, whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. 
Let a person examine him or herself. Only then eat the bread and drink from the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon him or herself. But if we judge ourselves truly, we will not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Please take a moment of silent confession. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks to you, and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the covenant of the this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of Jesus the Christ, we offer ourselves to him in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we always proclaim the mystery of our faith that says Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Father, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts. Father, we ask that you make these gifts the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, Lord, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry with all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forevermore. And now let us all pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as our most recent custom is, we invite you to come to the table as the Lord leads you. We ask that you exit your pews to the right and return back on the left side to keep from having a train wreck down here. But once you return to your seat, go ahead and and receive the bread, but hold the cup until we've all been served, and then we'll drink together. Come as you feel led. Thank you. 
because there is one cup of salvation, we are bonded together as one body. Let us all drink that cup of salvation together. Thank you, Father, for this holy mystery. Father, we thank you for the grace that you pour out in our lives. Father, let us go from this place and pour out that same grace upon your world, that same love upon this world and that same mercy upon this world that you have poured out upon us. Thank you, Father, for those gifts. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The fullness of your grace is here. we go from this place this morning, I want to challenge you or invite you to do two things. One, I want you to think about who invested in you. Who it was that has done life with you? And if that person is still living, would you just do me a favor today and call them and just say thank you for the investment that they made in your life? And if not, if they're not living, just thank the Lord for what it is that they did in your life. The second thing I want to invite you to do is just to ask God for a name of who it is that you might be able to invest in. And if you need a name, I want to invite you to meet Mr. Jake McKinnon, our director of student ministries here. He oversees our after-school program, and he would love to help you find that name. All God's people said, hallelujah, amen.